So we have previously examined what happens uh, when we have a, a single regression case, meaning that we have just a single explanatory variable x. So in this lesson, I want to then expand the analysis to the so-called multiple regression model where we can have multiple explanatory variables x. So to keep a close connection to our empirical example, and to gain some uh, practical insight, so let's consider again this uh, hedonic model of housing market in, uh, in Tapiola Espoo. So we want to uh, estimate the impact of uh, some explanatory variables X on the, on the market price of apartment. And uh, we denote that as the dependent variable Y, what we want to predict. And as our predictors or explanatory variables, I have now included three variables. So earlier we used only this uh, size of apartment in square meters, but now we have also information about number of bedrooms and uh, the age of apartments. It's uh, also, I think, useful to also think carefully about uh, what are the units of measurement, uh, even though this is not really often like uh, appearing in the in the theoretical text, but in practice, it's also also good for the meaning of this um, uh, interpretation of the coefficients and what kind of units this, uh, these uh, variables are measured in. Another practical thing uh, I would also recommend you to think about before running the regression already, when you have these uh, variables, then it's good to have in mind uh, that, okay, what kind of logic there is that, uh, why do I put these kind of variables rather than just dump any, any kind of data you might have to the regression equation it's good to be at least a little bit conscious about what is the, what's the meaning of these variables? Why do I believe that these variables might have an effect? Uh, so obviously uh, we would expect that bigger apartments should be more expensive, uh, but somehow people also seem to have a preference that, uh, that uh, uh, single, room apart single room apartments, two room apartments seem to be more valuable than three room or four room apartments, even if they're of the same same size in terms of square meters. And then of course, age might have a positive, might have a negative uh, impact. It might have actually a little bit nonlinear impact as well. So, but if you talk about the Tapiola market, then I would expect that uh, age has a negative impact because, uh, because uh, there are not really like historically like like really really old historical buildings but uh, they are um, since uh, maybe 1950s or 60s built all of them so typically newer ones would be better so uh, it's maybe good also to have some kind of impression you don't necessarily have to have some kind of uh, clear idea do you expect a positive or negative sign that could be also something that you are interested in estimating is the coefficient positive or negative? But if possible, then, then it also can help you to then read the results when you finally have them, that does it make any sense what you are actually getting there to have some kind of me meaning, okay, why, why do you put these uh, variables in the regression model in the first place? And what kind of sign do you expect to see? That is it, is it making a sense? If, if you're not sure, then it's also, also fine. To, to recognize that, but but in some cases it's quite clear that some some variables should have a positive sign or, or it should be a negative sign. Okay. So then, how does the regression equation look like when we have more than just one variable? So I will consider here there's uh, some general case with uh, with the capital K number of uh, of parameters. And here it is important to note this kind of uh, notational convention. I mean, in, in regression analysis, there are different notations depending on which book or which text you are reading. So I will, I will follow here. I believe this is consistent with the Jeffrey Wooldridge uh, textbook on econometrics uh, and, and many other texts as well. So I will, I will denote the intercept term as, as beta one as before. And uh, I will then, then label these explanatory variables, index them from, from two to capital K. So in this way, we have uh, parameters beta one, beta two, beta three, and so on and so on, running till, till beta capital K. So this means that we have uh, uh, K minus one 
explanatory variable. So the number of variables is one smaller than the number of parameters. And in all my notations in the following, I will use this kind of uh, kind of notation that we have k parameters, but k minus one variables, explanatory variables. And uh, this terminology may be also a little bit uh, uh, potentially confusing. So by variable here, I mean explanatory variables, but from the perspective of optimization, these uh, X and Y are actually observed data and uh, uh, optimization variables are actually those betas, like I have emphasized over and over again. So in what sense it is a variable, it is, it is slightly different if it depending on that. Do we talk about this, uh, these uh, explanatory variables or do we talk about optimization variables? So when we talk about linear regression, then the model should be linear and, and particularly it should be linear in terms of these parameters. And I come back to that in the, in the later talk in more detail. So this would be the multiple regression equation with multiple explanatory variables. So how does the interpretation of the coefficients then change when we, when we move from the single regression to the multiple regression? So recall that uh, in both the cases, we have had the same uh, slope coefficient beta 2 for the, for the uh, size in square meters. In the single regression model, then, then we discussed that this beta 2 can be interpreted as the, as the marginal effect. So in other words, the value of an additional square meter of space on average in apartments are located in the Stapiola district in Espoo. So when, when we also control for the number of bedrooms and the age of the apartment, then we still have this, uh, this kind of marginal interpretation. But now notice that we can think about this beta 2 as the value of an additional square meters <coughs> in uh, apartments that have same number of bedrooms and same age. So now this, this marginal effect is also conditional on the age and number of bedrooms of the apartment because we also control for those factors uh, in, this, uh, in this regression analysis. So in both cases, we have this uh, interpretation of the marginal effect, but it's not surprising that this, um, that this uh, estimated slope coefficient can change when we, when we introduce some additional explanatory variables to the regression equation. So even from the beginning, we shouldn't necessarily expect that uh, the slope should be the necessarily exactly the same. And uh, one more kind of technical, practical question. Uh, why do I not denote this uh, intercept term as beta 1? So this can be also helpful if you, if you later look at this kind of matrix vector representation. So notice that we could also, also think about this uh, uh, beta 1 as, as the product of beta 1 and an explanatory variable x, which takes the value of 1 for each and every observation. So in this housing market example, it would be 1 for each and every, every observation. We could have, for example, such kind of indicator variable, which takes a value of 1 whenever uh, it is an apartment in Espo and Tapiola district and value of 0 otherwise. So obviously for this sample, this x, x1 takes the value of 1 for each and every, every observation. So we can then harmlessly just uh, drop out this variable x i, x1. So you can think about this uh, a coefficient beta 1 as the coefficient of uh, such kind of uh, variable that captures everything that is common to these uh, all apartments in the sample. So they are all apartments, for example. So, so this would be this kind of, uh, kind of potential interpretation of this constant term. So in some sense, it's, it's like a coefficient of such kind of, uh, kind of uh, explanatory variable that just is the same for every, each and every observation in the sample. Okay. So now, what if we, how do we compute this uh, multiple regression model? So here I have I have done this kind of um, uh, typical typical regression statistics using Excel. 
and this is for the single regression case. So, so if you if you do this in Excel, I have here indicated uh, some some uh, links how to do it in Excel or how to do it in in R or Stata. So, so this would be the typical kind of uh, regression output that you actually get when you use some kind of regression software. In Excel, you can do it in this. Um, using this uh, data analysis tool pack and choosing regression tool. So you can get all of this information when you run a regression. Same if you do linear regression in Stata, this is what will similar, very similar output, the same kind of statistics you get in Stata and same also in R. If you, if you use some kind of linear regression package in R, so basically the same information you, you normally get. I will go through all of these in the in the coming coming uh, video lessons uh, but at this point i want to highlight you this uh, r squared statistic uh, which is on the top part of the table under this regression statistics and then uh, on the on the bottom part of the table we can find these coefficients uh, uh, of the intercept term and size in square meters so if you compare it to the to the previous slides that i have shown for example, in, in uh, 2A, I, I started with this scatter plot. So you can verify that we get the same coefficients and same R squared statistics as we would get if we, in the single regression case, if we, if we just put this uh, linear trend line to the scatter plot. Okay, you can also verify if you want to use data, if you want to use R, you can also verify that this uh, Coefficients estimated by, by, by Excel are the same as you would get with R or Stata. Otherwise, there's something wrong. This is something that you should get. Okay. So at this point, we start to then use some kind of regression tool with some software package. And like I mentioned, this uh, data set is available on the course website. So it's, it would be a good idea to replicate at this point, uh, uh, whatever software you want to use, then check that you can make the same results, uh, same coefficients and same R squared statistics as I have calculated here with Excel. And if you want to use Excel, that's also fine, but, but replicate this, this result, please. So this was the regression results with the single regression. So now keep attention, pay attention to this coefficient of the size of, uh, size of apartment in square meters. So the marginal impact of square meter in the single regression was this 5,460 and the unit would be euros per square meter. So 5,460 euros per square meter. So now I run next this uh, multiple regression model and I also uh, include number of bedrooms and, uh, and age. So this is something that I cannot do anymore with, the, with, the, with this uh, scatter plot uh, trend line tool so we need to use some software package but i can use for example this excel data analysis tool pack to do it and uh, notice now firstly if we compare the r squared statistics so now the r squared statistic uh, is uh, increases to 0 0.82 it was much lower in the single regression so that suggests that uh, we can explain a larger proportion of the variation in prices by the by the including also the number of bedrooms and age to this regression equation. We come back to that later. What is the exact interpretation of the R squared statistic? But now let's look at the coefficients. And uh, I suggested that uh, that uh, the expected signs of this coefficient would be that uh, that size in square meters should have positive impact, uh, whereas the number of bedrooms and age should have negative impacts, and that turns out to be the case also when, when I fit this uh, uh, regression equation to the data. Particularly, I ask you to pay attention to the, to the size in square meters. So it was uh, about 5,400 euros per square meter. In the single regression equation, notice now that we get much higher, almost 7,000 euros per square meter, when we take into account also the age of apartment and number of bedrooms in the apartment. So also there is this, uh, this, uh, this uh, age and bedrooms uh, influence the marginal value. So when, when we control for those factors, the marginal impact of square meter is much higher. So, and, I, and again, I, I already mentioned that you shouldn't also expect to get the same coefficient when you have more, more explanatory variables in the regression equation. <clears throat> 
So how does the computer calculate then this uh, this multiple regression equation? So I'll I'll briefly go through this also because uh, uh, like I mentioned in the previous lesson, it's good to understand that uh, that uh, when computer is calculating those regression coefficients, it's just using some some known formulas. There's nothing certainly nothing random about it, and there is. Uh, there is uh, no need to even optimize anything because this, these formulas are well known. So this is just now going through the same stuff that I, I went through in much more detail in the previous lesson, but just notice how the same analysis extends to the multiple regression case. So again, the least squares estimation, estimator by definition starts by minimizing the sum of squares of the residuals E. So I have here then stated first the uh, minimization problem, this minimizing RSS, which was the residual sum of squares subject to the constraint that this uh, linear regression equation must be satisfied. Then as the next step, we can then get rid of this, uh, these uh, residuals and in fact all the these constraints by substituting this EI by the difference of uh, YI minus b1 minus b2 times x2 minus b3 times x3 and so on and so on minus bk xk and taking the this difference and and uh, raising it to power 2 and summing over all observations i so this is equivalent way of expressing this objective function but now we don't we can we have moved from the constraint optimization to an unconstrained problem which is easier to easier to solve so now we have an optimization problem with not just two unknowns, but we have k unknowns. Like in the case of two unknowns, we can then develop the first order conditions. And uh, it turns out that this uh, uh, objective function is well behaved, uh, globally convex function. So the optimal solution is found in the, uh, in the critical point where all these first order conditions are satisfied. So what we need to do is then we take the partial derivatives of the ob objective function with respect to constant b1 uh, and also the slope b2 and so on and so on until this last bk. So this will give us a system of uh, k equations and it turns out that they are actually all linear in parameters and so we have k linear equations and k unknowns so b1, b2, b3 and so on until bk and uh, then we need to solve this kind of system of, of uh, k unknowns with k linear equations. And uh, this is actually uh, rather tedious to do in general, but in, in the, if we use then uh, matrix algebra, then, then we have actually quite convenient, uh, quite, quite convenient uh, uh, and, and compact solution. So on this next slide, I just show you this uh, this solution. So if you know vectors and matrices, so now here this capital B indicates this vector of of uh, of coefficients b1, b2, b3, and so on, and capital X uh, is a matrix of our our explanatory variables, and y is a vector of uh, of this our dependent variables. So. I think I do not uh, want to explain this uh, equation in detail. Uh, my point here is to just illustrate that uh, using matrix algebra, you can you can write this uh, closed form of solution in a very simple and elegant way. And uh, and uh, otherwise it would be very tedious using this uh, sigma notation, for example. I will show you shortly that how, how, how cryptic it becomes even in the case of two explanatory variables. So, but uh, but uh, so I understand that that, that uh, many of you actually actually know uh, matrix algebra and you could also also uh, interpret this equation. That's great. If you want to study econometrics at a little bit more advanced level, then this is actually something that you need to also master. So it's very important that if you want to proceed to the next level in econometrics, take more advanced econometrics courses. It's important that you take also before that some some courses on matrix algebra. Make sure that you 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 can read this kind of notations, and you can perform this kind of like taking 
taking inverse of matrix and you, you, you understand the basic concepts like inverse and transpose and so on. Uh, that's very important because at more advanced level, then this is heavily used. But uh, for the purposes of the present course, um, I will I will come back a little bit to this matrix equation uh, when we come to the to the instrumental variables. But uh, most of the ideas we can understand also without really going to the matrix algebra. So for the sake of intuition, this is why in this course I will I will very very much focus on the single regression case where we don't really need to need to go to this uh, this uh, vector matrix notation, which in my experience is uh, is uh, can be some kind of hurdle for learning uh, for those of you who have not really really mastered the matrix algebra at that uh, that detail level. So to understand the main main econometric insights, I think it's it's uh, it's uh, not so critically important to go to this uh, to this. Uh, heavy arsenal of matrix algebra, we can get some insights also in the simpler case of, of, uh, of uh, single regression or, or two exponential variables, uh, because the same ideas then generalize quite easily to the general case with K variables. Okay. So what could we say, then say about this, uh, this closed form solution? So for example, still the intercept um, has this property like, like if you compare to the single regression case and also in multiple regression case, the optimal intercept is to, to set it uh, equal to the sample average of Y minus B2 times sample average of X2. But then we also have, need to have this, this uh, X3 and so on and so on. So this solution implies that also this interpretation that I stated in the last lesson, that, uh, that the regression line always passes through the, the sample average of x and y's so that still applies in the multiple regression case so if you take the sample average of all uh, explanatory variables and sample average of y then the regression line always has to go through this point where the sample average is is found now i mentioned that uh, that uh, this uh, closed form solution becomes quite tedious if you don't use matrix algebra and to illustrate this uh, Consider just the case of two explanatory variables, x2 and x3. And let's just consider the slope uh, b2. So you can think about what would be the slope of the size in square meters when we also uh, explain it by the number of rooms, number of bedrooms, if you like. So here I have reproduced this, uh, this, uh, this uh, closed form solution in the case of two explanatory variables. So I mentioned in the previous lesson that uh, that uh, when you run a linear regression, the computer doesn't really need to solve any kind of uh, uh, any kind of optimization. It doesn't have to be unconstrained or constrained optimization. It mainly needs to solve a lot of uh, covariances and variances. And uh, this is to illustrate this fact also. So the B2, you can calculate it as this kind of ratio, which includes some uh, sample covariances between the exponatory variables x2 and x3 and, and dependent variable y, but also there is the sample covariance of x2 and x3 also taken into account. So, so this kind of ratio doesn't have so immediate uh, connection to, to the correlation coefficient as in the case of single regression, but anyway, the linear regression heavily is, is based on this covariances, so, so correlations between, between variables. So now consider, keep in mind this equation and consider then how this kind of correlation between uh, exponatory variables x2 and x3 uh, influences the results. So earlier I mentioned that, uh, that uh, the coefficient of the size in square meters changes in this hedonic modeling of housing market when we introduce additional exponatory variables. So suppose in this equation, what would happen if, uh, if uh, this uh, sample variant, oh, sorry, sample covariance of X2 and X3 was zero. So what if the, what if these uh, uh, X2 and X3 were statistically independent, for example? So notice that if then sample covariance of X2 and X3, which is the, 
the last uh, component in the nominator, if that would be zero, and also if the sample covariance of x2 and x3 in this denominator would be equal to zero. So then we would have this, uh, both uh, these uh, components with the, with the minus sign would be cancelled out from the nominator and denominator. And then also the sample variance of x3, which is also included in the both nominator and denominator, those could be, uh, those can cancel out. So what we have left with is actually then just sample covariance between x2 and y and sample variance of x2. So in that case, if the sample covariance between x2 and x3 is equal to zero, or in other words, if x2 and x3 do not correlate with each other, then actually the slope would be the same as it would be in the single regression case. You can verify it from this, uh, this, this equation. So I have stated it here in this, uh, this slide in more detail. So if in the sample correlation between x2 and x3 happens to be equal to zero, only in that case, your regre multiple regression equation gives you the same, same uh, coefficient exactly as it would be in the case of a single regression. You can also think of it in other way that, that okay, uh, should we take into account some kind of variable that, that might influence the dependent variable? So it wouldn't disturb uh, your, your, it wouldn't affect anything if, if it's uncorrelated with your explanatory variables, if you're mainly interested in this B2. But I'll come back to that point uh, later on. At this point, it's important to understand that how this, uh, this correlation between explanatory variables influences the result. And in some sense, it should, because like I mentioned in the, in the uh, interpretation, the interpretation of B2 in the multiple regression um, context is that it's, it's this marginal effect of uh, X2 uh, conditional on this other, other variables. So this, this impacts of other variables are also taken into account in the estimation. Okay. So as the next topic, then I will introduce you the, the standard error and also, also the multicollinearity, which is also closely related to this correlation between exponential variables. Okay, thanks for your attention and see you in the next lesson.